Well, I think I think we can start already. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon in Korea and good morning in Spain. I welcome you to the Madrid International Arbitration Center or MIAC and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board International, KCAB International webinar called The Influence of Civil Law Jurisdictions and Their Businesses Cultures on International Arbitration Practice. My name is Peter Barna and I'm pleased to be your MC today. Thank you all for taking this time to join us and discuss the, the differences and similarities of these two jurisdictions and, and cultures when it comes to international arbitration practice. We will begin with a welcome address and introduction by Mr. Jose Antonio Cainzos, who is the president of the Madrid International Arbitration Center, MIAC. Mr. Cainzos, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear all. First of all, I would like to thank every one of you for joining us today in this interesting event about the arbitration practice in the two concurring jurisdictions, South Korea and Spain. The event today will be focused on discussing the similarities and differences, new trends and notable developments of international arbitration, aspects all of great interest. As president of the Madrid International Arbitration Center, and on his behalf, I would sincerely thank the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board for co-organizing this webinar with us, especially to Sue, Secretary General of KCAB International, for all your effort and time. I would, I would also like to thank our speakers, Lucia, Enrique, Hyun Yang, and Javier, for accepting our invitation to participate in today's event. It's a great pleasure to count on your participation. I personally consider this event as the stone that represents only the beginning of a fruitful and long-standing relationship between KCAV and MIAC, two innovative arbitral institutions for international dispute resolution, which focus on providing independent, transparent, and efficient dispute resolution services. Thus, I must say that MIAC is thrilled to be able to collaborate actively with KCAB, the arbitral reference in its jurisdiction, well known for its good practices and positive development. On top of the institutional relationship, both countries' legal system are based on a civil law system, which operates as a disputed link for the two jurisdictions the two institutions and all the arbitration practitioners of South Korea and Spain. Because of the prior, I want to encourage all colleagues interested in arbitration to get connect with the practitioners of other jurisdiction in order to explore its particularities and identify all the similarities of the two legal systems and the effects on the arbitration practice which will come to a surprise to many, despite how far we are from each other geographically. All that being said, I finalize thanking you all again for being with us today, and I hope you enjoy the event and take advantage of this impressive panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kainthos, for uh, your welcome and kind words. We will next have the introduction of welcome address by Ms. Su Hyun Lim, Secretary General of the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board International, or KCAB International. Ms. Hyun Lim, please. Hey, thank you, Peter. And buenos dias y bienvenidos a todos. Uh, 여러분, 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. It is a pleasure as the Secretary General of KCAB International to give these opening remarks to the first joint webinar co-hosted by the Madrid International Arbitration Center and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board. In this webinar, we hope to bring together the international arbitration communities of Spain and Korea closer together through a discussion among a group of panelists who have been selected because of their ties to both regions. It is these sort of ties that we hope to nurture in the future, starting with the webinar of today. Since establishing diplomatic ties in 1950, 
Korea is now Spain's third largest market in Asia, with bilateral trade having reached 5.3 billion euros in 2018-19. Uh, Korea has, is also the third biggest source of Asian tourists for Spain, sending some 630,000 tourists in 2019. The two jurisdictions, as mentioned um, earlier by the, the president of, of, of MIAC, the two jurisdictions also share similar legal traditions in that both countries are have a civil law uh, tradition. Despite the potential closeness of the two jurisdictions, most of the interaction between the two in the field of international dispute have so far been done indirectly and through intermediaries, so to speak. Korean companies are avid users of international arbitrations, and many of the high value cases at global institutions such as the ICC, LCIA, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, et cetera, involve Korean interests. I understand Spanish companies are also very active in the field of arbitration. So because of this background, if Currently, a dispute arises between companies in East Asia, like Korea, and a company in Spain or Latin America, it is more likely that they will resolve these disputes in the forum of these older and more established institutions. And in these forums, regardless of the legal traditions that they are more familiar with, uh, companies of, these, of both sides will likely deploy and employ procedural practices and tools which originate from common law jurisdictions under the, the common belief that this is the golden standard of international arbitration. This is something that can be improved in many ways. Thanks to the recent establishment of MIAC as an international arbitration center in Spain, there has been an increasing awareness and interest expanding direct channels between Korea and Spain in the field of international arbitration. For example, one could consider either country as a seat for arbitration in cases or disputes between companies from both regions or the two regions. Another possibility is to share common information on the pool of experienced arbitrators uh, who are based on, on either Spain or Korea and so that the parties can choose arbitrators who understand and sympathize with the expectation of parties, of international parties who have civil law background in common. The specific projects that we hope to create to improve further collaboration between uh, Korea and Spain's arbitration communities is something that we are still developing and we are still exploring. But I am confident that the more interaction we have among our members of both communities, the more promising and fruitful the search will be. I hope today's discussion will be one of those many, one of those many fruitful searches. And without further ado, I will turn back to the MC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hilim, for your warm words and your welcome. Uh, now, let me introduce the, the panel for the discussions of the influence of civil law jurisdictions and their businesses, cultures, and international arbitration practice. The panelists are Mr. Enrique Villaplana, foreign senior attorney at Union Yang LLC and president at the Spanish Chamber of Commerce in Korea. Then we have Ms. Hyun Jung Lee, Senior Foreign Attorney, Partner at Bay Kim M. Lee LLC. We also have Ms. Lucia Montes, Senior Associate at um, the International Arbitration Practice Group in Cuatro Casas. And Mr. Javier Diez Fogleitner, Partner at Jose Maria Alonso Abogados and Law Professor at the Autonomous University of Madrid. Now I'll leave the floor the moderator, so we can begin our discussions today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And um, I, uh, as the moderator for the panelists, I thank all the speakers again for agreeing to join and sharing their insights about disputes resolution in Korea and in, in Spain. Um, and overall in East Asia region and um, the, the Spanish speaking 
community. So today, uh, I would like to start with the first topic um, that we had discussed previously, which is an introduction to Spain and Korea as the seat of arbitration. Uh, many arbitration users know about the traditional arbitration hubs that uh, have been in the field for a longer time, but um, for Koreans, Spain might still feel unknown and vice versa for Spain, Korea might still be an unknown jurisdiction. So I'd like to first invite Lucia to discuss more or less the legal structure of how arbitration is considered and dealt in a legal perspective um, from, the, from the perspective of Spain. And then later I will ask Hyunjung to draw parallels or compare that with Korea. So first I'd like to invite Lucia to talk about the legal infrastructure of, of arbitration law in Spain, please. Of course, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sue. Thank you also to Jose Antonio and to Peter for their very nice uh, words and kind introduction. Um, I would like to start first of all by congratulating both the Madrid International Arbitration Center and the Korean Commercial Arbitration Board for the collaborative relationship that they are celebrating today. Um, I hope this agreement will be very fruitful for both institutions and in broader terms, of course, for uh, arbitration practitioners, both in Korea and, and in Spain. Uh, I am also, of course, very grateful to both institutions for kindly inviting me to participate in this panel uh, with these very distinguished colleagues. And of course, to our audience, amongst uh, who I see uh, several very good friends uh, who uh, I salute. Um, I will be now very pleased to briefly um, introduce uh, the audience to my jurisdiction in Spain in terms of uh, international arbitration law. So uh, first thing first, um, Spain's regulation on arbitration is gathered in one single piece of legislation, the Spanish Arbitration Act, which entered into force in 2004 and has only been modified once. Uh, in 2011. And in fact, the 2011 modification was uh, quite a limited one. So we can say that uh, the regulation has remained essentially the same for almost 18 years now. This is a positive feature of Spain's regulation for international arbitration, in my opinion, because it has triggered a wide body of consistent uh, decisions in arbitration. It has enabled the Spanish uh, judiciary to be truly familiar with this regulation. And at the end of the day, it has fostered uh, predictable outcomes for cases seated in Spain. The Spanish Arbitration Act is not only a stable one, but a high quality one. It expressly follows the unicitral model law on international commercial arbitration, uh, to which it added some minor uh, but relevant improvements. Uh, therefore, this act is clearly in line with the most developed uh, legislations on arbitration in other countries. Importantly, the Spanish um, uh, regulation um, uh, follows a monist doctrine. Uh, which establishes the, the uh, same regime for arbitration, regardless of it being a national or international case. Uh, Monist regulations, as opposed to dualist ones, uh, for example, as the ones followed in, in very well-known uh, jurisdictions, uh, I could quote France as an example, um, are to be seen, in my opinion, as a relevant advantage. Uh, Monist regulation simplifies uh, very much the regulation in whole. It fosters predictable answers to the most relevant uh, questions that can be raised uh, regarding international arbitration. And uh, more importantly, it unburdens for the, uh, foreign investors and foreign uh, um, practitioners uh, from having to analyze whether their specific case will qualify as an international one or not in the future. Um, regarding the relationship between national courts and arbitration, I would say that Spanish uh, judiciary is uh, doubtlessly supportive of arbitration. Foreign awards are easily recognized in Spain. Annulment of arbitral awards is very narrow and limited to generally pathological cases. I believe uh, Javier will further elaborate on recent developments in this matter later. Um, and in some Spanish courts strictly follow the rule of minimum intervention uh, consecrated in Article 7 of the Spanish Arbitration Act. 
Um, Spain is also a party to the 1958 New York Convention and the Geneva Convention of 1927. Both of them, as uh, the audience know, foster a friendly framework for the recognition and enforcement of foreign awards in Spain, and they also facilitate recognition and enforcement of uh, Spanish awards abroad. Um, Spain um, is also a favorable jurisdiction for the purpose of enforcement uh, once uh, an award has been recognized. Um, the only potential downside to this could be uh, the 2015 Act on State Immunity and Privileges, which has rendered it slightly more difficult to achieve award enforcement against a sovereign state. But of course, this is only um, a concern for cases involving a state or state party and not a concern for commercial cases. Um, finally, um, I cannot bring this uh, brief description to an end uh, without devoting a couple of minutes to soft law. Spanish courts have always recognized the importance of soft law publications in matters related to international arbitration. Uh, there are many references, for example, in Spanish judicial decisions to IBA publications in matters such as uh, independence and impartiality or taking um, of evidence. But I am especially interested in referring to homemade uh, soft law in this point. Uh, this is to the publications and recommendations issued by the Spanish Arbitration Club which is a major organization in our jurisdiction. Many of you might be familiar with it. In fact, the club's influence is well beyond the boundaries of uh, Spain's uh, jurisdiction. And um, it is now a big player in terms of, of promoting uh, international arbitration, both in Spanish and in Portuguese. So in year uh, 2019, the, the Spanish Arbitration Club launched its uh, new code for best practices in arbitration. And this code constitutes a compilation of recommendation, which the club um, offers, I would say, to the entire arbitration community. Its content is truly ambitious in two ways. Based uh, first because of the uh, wide range of matters regulated in one single code. Um, the code sets forth uh, rules um, which in uh, the author's uh, opinions should be followed by arbitral institutions, arbitrators, lawyers, experts, and even third party founders. And it also annexes um, an updated model arbitration rule, uh, set of arbitration rules, which uh, by the way, have been uh, at the essence of, of the model followed by the Madrid International Arbitration Court in order to, to prepare and to launch its own uh, set of, of arbitration rules. So here you see a good example of how this code uh, has already had big impact uh, um, in, in the real world. Um, it also includes a model arbitration clause and model acceptance uh, forms for arbitrators and experts. And second, uh, I would say that the call is, is very ambitious too because of the very high standards that it recommends, uh, that it recommends, sorry, uh, both for independence, impartiality, but also for transparency and professionalism uh, applicable to all participants in the arbitration process. So uh, Sue, maybe I would suggest that we leave it here for the moment and, and we can uh, further elaborate on, on recent developments uh, further uh, down the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Yes, and the CEA is the entity that is, is well known outside of Spain and, and Portugal. Um, even here in Korea, we, we hear about it. And Good to know. <laughs> the newsletters as well. Um, so, which explains sounds somewhat familiar for someone who has done arbitration in Korea, especially about the OCI trial rule or model law um, and the, the unity and the ability to mobilize the arbitration committee community for the promotion of arbitration. So maybe I should turn to Hyunjung, uh, who's been practicing in Korea in the arbitration area for some time to share us about the arbitration infrastructure in Korea and how it feels like to be there in the scene. So Hyunjung, please. Thank you so much, Sirian. Um, I also want to join uh, Lucia in thanking the invitation to this eminent panel and congratulating both institutions in starting this co collaboration, which I hope is the first step to increase and closer uh, cooperation in also in the arbitration community. And as uh, Sirian was already mentioning, there is already a lot of um, investment and commercial business going on between the two countries. So. Um, perhaps not the 
the best remark, but us as arbitration practitioners, you know, with increased business transactions, there is, of course, increased uh, need for lawyers and for dispute resolution. So that, that one thing, you know, would lead for an next. In any case, um, uh, as Jose Antonio Ganes was also mentioned, um, Although both countries are quite far apart geographically, actually it is not very uh, far apart in terms of arbitration infrastructure and framework. Um, as I, I would not want to repeat, but basically a lot of the things that Lucia explained also applies to Korea. Uh, so Korea's uh, Arbitration Act is uh, slightly older. The first Arbitration Act was enacted in 1960s and it, it underwent a few amendments. Uh, the first one in the late 90s to adopt the Uncitral Model Law. So Korea is also a Uncitral Model Law country, which was a, a it was the first Asian country to adopt the Uncitral Model Law. Then it also adopted the revised version in 2006. So that was the second major amendment to the Arbitration Act. Uh, uh, Korea is also a um, member of the New York Convention. So uh, many of the qualities uh, in terms of the uh, stand international, following the international standard in arbitration, domestic arbitration law applicable to international arbitration, and also for the interrelation between the uh, courts and the arbitration pra practice in terms of um, enforcement and recognition of arbitral awards, um, minimum intervention, minimum supervision, uh, trying to recognize and enforce unless there are major um, breaches of the due process and so on that are uh, enshrined in the New York Convention. So following really international standards, uh, enforcing arbitration agreements and having very limited grounds for annulment. Um, so all those things resonate in the Korean uh, arbitration practice as well. Korea is also a member of ICSID, which joined in 1967, and this is the International Center for Settlement of, this, of Investment Disputes, which uh, would be addressed later on uh, today on, uh, in terms of the investment settlement, investment dispute settlement. But, um, and, and also both countries are growing arbitration users and growing as arbitration seat. Um, I was actually surprised joining Korea and joining BKL in the practice of arbitration in Korea, how much actually uh, of international disputes were seated in Korea using Korean law as governing law in the international contract. So there is a, definitely an increase of that. And I believe it, this is similar and parallel to also the practice in Spain. Um, more and more you see local firms acting as main only in lead counsel. There are more appointment of arbitrators of Korean nationality for both like um, arbitrations that involve Korean parties and also arbitrations that do not involve Korean parties. And I believe this is um, a result of both um, having a stable growth on arbitration and recognition of the rule of law and uh, uh, being arbitration friendly uh, place um, in, in, in all the aspects that in, are entailed in, the, in this. Um, there's very reliable uh, and strong support of the courts and the arbitration community, of course. There is one particular point, uh, and I'm not sure what is the case in Spain, but in Korea, there is no particular arbitration court. I believe it might be the same in Spain, but the courts are, and the judges are very familiar with all the applicable international arbitration laws, including the New York Convention. Um, if I may draw back a little bit to the general topic of the uh, uh, general topic of this uh, webinar of the influence of civil jurisdiction. So, of course, the the uh, basic parallel between the two countries is that both are civil law countries and they share the same uh, hurdles and obstacles as, and challenges of being civil law countries that have to um, em embrace the somewhat mixed and hybrid uh, practice that is international arbitration. So we have the same, probably the same difficulties in explaining our clients on what, what are the key differences of international arbitration practice from the domestic civil law litigation, including in terms of discovery document production and, uh, and all these um, different special features of arbitration. And I, I think I may be running a little bit short of time. So perhaps I will leave some of the more particular details to uh, Q&A sessions if, 
if there are interest in knowing more about this. All right, thank you. Thank you, Hanjan, so much for this. After listening to both you and Lucia, it seems like both jurisdictions are fully matured arbitration, uh, arbitration friendly jurisdictions. Um, all, all we have to add there is more disputes that are being overseen by uh, e either arbitration systems or, or legal acts in, in either jurisdiction. So the relevant question there, I guess, is how frequent are legal disputes, I mean, if, if, there, if there are any, and if there are the, 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 those legal disputes, where, what type of transactions they come from, and how are they usually resolved? So that moves up, takes us to the next topic. And for this, um, we've actually tapped a speaker from Korea, from another Korean firm, who just by looking at the gallery may not look like a Korean speaker, but we have Henry Kip, who works with Yoon and Yang, uh, a, major, a major firm here in Korea, who's seen a lot of action on uh, between both regions. So Enrique, could you tell us about what type of transactions you usually see when, when conversing with your clients and what type of disputes and how they're generally resolved? So the floor is yours. I think you're muted, so if you could unmute yourself. Yep, that's it. Sorry, had to reinitiate the sound. Well, thank you, Sergion, uh, for for uh, giving me the, the chance to to talk on behalf of our Korean uh, firm. Thank you, Jose Antonio and. Uh, both institutions for, for this uh, collaboration and the organization of this webinar. And also thank you for the distinguished uh, panelists, colleagues uh, we have today here. Um, I, I would like to talk uh, about, about this topic, Sohyun, uh, but I would like to add another perspective. When we talk about Korea and Spain, we are, you know, uh, on delivering one missing um, region, which is, I think, uh, based on, on my experience, that uh, it's, it's uh, not recent, it's a trend that came over the last maybe 10 years, but it's an interesting question uh, to deal with. Uh, but first to talk about Asia, about arbitration, and, our, and about uh, Latin America, because uh, I leave the field of Spain and Korea to Xinjiang and, and to Lucia. Uh, I would like just to mention some of the of the main trends in corporate arbitration, and for that we need to take first into account that uh, increasingly parties based in Asia are selecting a seat of arbitration in Asia rather than looking to historic centers such as, as London or Paris. Um, from our side, we have seen an increase in disputes arising from insolvency proceedings following the global financial turmoil of recent years. And at the same time, we have also seen an upswing in the number of clients seeking advice on possible claims against uh, states arising under bilateral investment treaties. Um, also here it continues to be work driven by disputes and litigation relating uh, to the sale of financial products, investigations arising from increased regulatory oversight, labor disputes, and of course, breach of contract matters. Uh, actually, there has been a, a dramatic growth in international commercial arbitration in Asia, said, and a rise in the uh, number of cases administered by arbitral institution based in, in Asia. Uh, more recently, as Asian economies uh, rebound quicker from, from the last financial crisis, it has caused a surge in exports and outbound investment, but also claims originated within, within the pandemic, which has led uh, to greater appreciation of the value of arbitration clauses in, in contracts. So as Asian economies slowly recover, companies are likely to arbitrate the disputes as opposed to 10 years ago when parties were interested in a quick settlement due to the time and cost involved. So um, to see which is the origin, the parallels of the uh, investment business relationship between Asia and Latin America, we need to go back a little bit uh, to, the, to the history from the international uh, perspective. 
uh, investment, uh, international investment law uh, has been, uh, as, as people may know, has been dominated by capital exporting countries in Western Europe and North America mainly. The classic uh, formulation of international minimum standard of the treatment of aliens and the right of uh, the diplomatic protection uh, appeared in the late 19th century and, and the early 20th century in, in, in the context of protecting Western European and North American investments in, in Latin America through arbitral awards uh, that were named uh, as, as a claims commission. Well, after the Second uh, World War, Western Europe took the lead in concluding the bilateral investment treaties, the, the also known as uh, BIT, with capital importing countries. Later on, the US and Canada did the same uh, based on the NAFTA uh, investment chapter. Well, that, that, that was uh, also a precedent of including investment chapters in, in the FTAs, the free trade agreements. Actually, Western Europe and America has also, has also been active players in investor state dispute settlements, which is now uh, with uh, ISDS. Well, in contrast, Asia has largely been rule takers in, in international investment law. And although the first BIT was concluded by Pakistan and the first BIT based arbitration took place between a Hong Kong company and Sri Lanka, uh, many countries in Asia have not been active in concluding BITs or uh, an FTAs with investment chapters. Asian, Asian countries have also kept uh, a low profile in uh, uh, ISDS, both uh, as a claimant and as a respondent. Well, the geography of international investment law has, however, started to change during the past decade. And Asia countries have come to actively develop their networks of BIT and FTAs uh, being uh, Korea, China, and India, the most active in that. Uh, years ago, Asia has been actively engaged in, in the regional rulemaking in international investment law. We have the Asian Comprehensive Investment Agreement or the China-Japan-Korea Trilateral Investment Agreement or the investment chapter included in the TPP. So those are notable examples. Um, uh, there is no to say that the changing, the changing landscape of international investment law in Asia raises a number of questions to be seriously dealt with. Um, on the other side, uh, about Latin America, uh, I think that uh, there is no opposition in saying that the economic and political interest of Asian countries in the uh, Ibero-American region has been incessantly growing in, in recent years. So for example, the investments of China, of China, sorry, Japan and, and Korea in the region have been also become more relevant. Chinese investments are growing faster, but the stock of Japanese investments is still much bigger. Uh, China is still focused in securing energy and raw materials for their industry. Uh, and although there is room for diversification in areas such as agricultural products and infrastructure. With uh, very similar origins, uh, Japanese investments are highly diversified nowadays. We have a clear focus in services. And meanwhile, the Korean investments in Ibero America are rather diversified with predominance of manufacturers. It's clear that uh, China is moving towards more liberal mechanisms for the uh, settlement of, of investment disputes in order to grant legal protection to its investments abroad. As, as, as its role as a capital exporter uh, consolidates, I mean, on, on their side, Japan and Korea, yes, also, also received uh, huge amounts of foreign capital from, from abroad, but they became net capital exporters in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, another uh, circumstance that we need to, to take into account is that China made the general ICS ID convention, which is the reservation to the convention, to the Washington Convention, sorry. And that increases the scope of arbitrable disputes through a huge amount of bilateral and regional treaties with very different degrees of liberalization compromises. Korea and Japan on their, on Japan on their side uh, made no reservation to the Washington Convention 
and include modern jurisdictional means for the settlement of disputes in their bilateral treaties in the field of investments. Uh, well, the three nations of Far East Asia have developed mechanisms for the facilitation of investments and, and obviously for the avoidance of disputes. And the origin for these known litigation mechanisms in the field of investments, uh, some people ask me about if, if they could be found in the Confucian, Confucian tradition. But I think that, in fact, uh, similar proposals have emerged in, in countries that do not share this, this cultural heritage, right? Uh, for example, Brazil. Unlike in, other, in Latin America, where political tensions coexist nowadays among supporters and detractors of solving disputes in international jurisdiction forums, well, among Far East Asian countries, there is no hesitation about the need of international jurisdiction mechanisms for dispute settlement as a mean of last resort and the uh, cooperation and facilitation methods are complementary, although of great importance to our jurisdictional uh, ones. Uh, the current political trend in, in, in Ibero-America seems to be generally favorable to the protection of foreign investments with exceptions such as, as Venezuela, but even I think that even in a cyclical conjuncture of political uh, turmoil, contract-based arbitration is, is still possible. I think that the inclusion of survival provisions in bilateral treaties may also enable the use of treaty-based arbitration, uh, even after the eventual denunciation of international treaties in the field of, of investments. Um, so far, uh, and this is a, a, a topic I, I leave on the table, there is no arbitration chamber clearly specialized in the administration of investment disputes between Asia and Latin America. Arbitration institutions such as KCAB, uh, I think that uh, should aim at administering these disputes. And the second issue is that uh, I think that an arbitration chamber located in a, in a third country with root relations with both regions such as Spain could be an, an additional warranty of, of neutrality for that. So I, I, I trigger everybody to push uh, to that side. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting to note uh, the overview of how the dispute or the, the, the trend of the disputes um, among investors that are inbound and both outbound in Asia have developed over the years. And, uh, and, then, and I noticed as I was listening to you, I was reminded that um, although commercial arbitration has been around for a long time and merchants have been using it throughout the years, it is with the introduction of treaty arbitration, which involves governments that sparks the general interest of arbitration overall. Um, and it actually educates the general public on what arbitration is and indirectly encourages people to think about arbitration as an alternative dispute resolution method. Um, and, and I think that's a very nice transition to the next topic under this general topic, which is, um, is how is the trend and um, how is arbitration um, being perceived in Spain and how do you compare um, how it was perceived 10 or 20 years ago as now and this is since this is a topic on Spain, I'll invite Javier to talk about the the trend in dispute resolution and, and the growing interest in arbitration as perceived in Spain. Javier, please. Well, thank you, Sue. Let me express that it is a great pleasure to share the, this seminar with all of you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both institutions for inviting me to participate in this event. I, I will first focus on commercial arbitration and later on investment arbitration. As regard uh, commercial arbitration, I would like to start referring to the growth in the number of cases submitted to arbitration in Spain after the enactment of uh, the current Arbitration Act. There is also a, a growing tendency for large Spanish company, companies to resort to international arbitration based in Spain or abroad, which is a consequence of a huge huge investment made in the last decade in other markets, such as uh, the Latin American market. A report prepared recently by a Spanish law firm 
shows uh, that 40, 45% of large and medium-sized Spanish company have been involved in one or more arbitration proceedings in the last five years. With regard to arbitration based in Spain, a report from the Spanish Judicial uh, Council indicates that there were more than 1,200 cases of enforcement of awards to the national courts in 2017, compared to something more than six, 700 in 2019, uh, in 2009, excuse me. These figures do not include, of course, awards uh, voluntary enforced, which are the vast majority. The growing interest of Spanish companies in arbitration has also led to many forums, journals, or meetings of an, on arbitration. Suffice it to mention the creation in 2005 of the Spanish Group of Arbitration, which uh, with more than 1,300 members and three, uh, 30 international chapters uh, all around the world. Secondly, I have observed in recent years a tendency for arbitration proceedings in which Spanish companies uh, are involved to gradually accept procedural uh, rules that deviate from our civil law tradition. I should mention that it's common today to agree on a document production phase on two rounds of briefs on the requirement that witness uh, statements be formulated in writing or on cross-examination in hearings. Thirdly, I would like to mention that the most important Spanish arbitration courts increasingly, de increasingly uh, uh, deal with international arbitration and aim to attract more international cases. This is why the Madrid International Arbitration Center was recently created by agreement between the Spanish Court of Arbitration, the Civil and Commercial Court of Madrid, and the Madrid Court of Arbitration. All these institutions bring together uh, through MIAC the experience in, many, in administrated, uh, administrating international arbitrations. Concerning international uh, investment arbitration, I will refer to three topics. First, the end of intra-European Union investment arbitrations. Second, the increase of arbitration proceedings against Spain. And third, the new free, free trade agreements concluded by the European Union. With regard to the end of intra-European Union investment arbitrations, in 2008, the European Court of Justice rendered its judgment in the Admea case. The court ruled that investment arbitration based on inter-European Union BITs are incompatible with European Union law insofar as they affect disputes governed by European Union law and the powers of the European Court itself. As a result of ADMEA in May 2020, Spain signed a treaty with the other member states according to terminate, terminate all BITs applicable with, between them. However, Spain maintains more than 60 BATs, including a BAT with Korea. All of these BATs follow the classic OECD model. Moreover, it is worth highlighting a clear increase in the number of claims filed by Spanish investors based on these BATs, mainly against uh, Latin American states. Suffice it to mention that since 2010, 42 requests for arbitration by Spanish investors have been submitted only to exit. Concerning the increase of arbitration against Spain, I should mention that uh, until 2012, only two requests for arbitration were filed against Spain. However, since 2012 and to date, more than 50 arbitration requests have been filed all of them based on the Energy Charter Treaty, except for one. In total, the claims amount to about 10,000 million euros. All these arbitrations are a consequence of various modifications to the promotion plan for re renewable energy promulgated in 2000, which created a favorable investment regime for the sector, particularly in respect of tariff incentives. Following the, for the global financial crisis of uh, 2008, these inse incentives were largely withdrawn, provoking the presentation of the arbitration, arbitration claims. As of March 2020, most of the arbitrations have resulted in awards against Spain, considering that the modification of the, of the plan of 2000 
breach the legit, legitimate expectations of the investors and therefore the right to fair and equitable treatment. However, the six hours forward to Spain. Since the Agmea judgment, the Spanish government, as well as the European Commission, which has intervened in numerous cases as Amicus Curie, have been arguing that the Agmea doctrine should apply to arbitration with investors from other European Union member states. Arbitral tribunals exceed annulment committees, and most national courts dealing with set aside proceedings have either considered, not considered about to be bound by ACMEA, or have considered that it does not apply to the Energy Charter Treaty, a multilateral treaty, as you know, to which both the European Union and its member states are party. However, on September 2, the European Court issued a judgment as a consequence of a preliminary ruling by the Cour d'Appel de Paris, in which it says that it states that Article 26 of the Energy Charter Treaty must be interpreted as not being applicable to disputes between an investor of one member state and another member state. We must now wait and see what impact this ruling will have on the ongoing arbitration against Spain. And finally, towards regarding the new free trade agreements concluded by the European Union. In recent years, the European Union has, la had launch, has launched negotiations with several countries to conclude free trade agreements, which include chapters on investment protection, which provide for investment arbitration. In the case of investors of the other party, these agreements provide for the possibility that claims may be filed either against the European Union or against member states, depending on whether the challenge measure, measures were enacted by the European Union or the member states. The conclusion of this new uh, free trade agreement is due to uh, the Lisbon Treaty, which gave the European Union exclusive competence to conclude investment protections, protection agreements with third countries. To date, the European Union has concluded a new free trade agreement with Canada, Singapore, and Vietnam, which replaces the VITs previously entered by the member states with these third countries. The VITs entered into by member states with other third countries will remain in force until they are replaced by agreements entered by the European Union itself. I want to emphasize that these new agreements do not follow the traditional OECD model, but rather the US model of 2004, going even farther in preventing or preserving the regulatory powers of the uh, European Union and the states party, as well as in the matters such as transparency of the arbitration proceedings or treaty shopping. But, uh, that's uh, what uh, I wanted to, to uh, express uh, concerning the new trends in Spain on arbitration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for introducing a, a very hot topic in arbitration all around the world. Um, it, it's, I know it's a, a moving piece that many people are, are following, um, and it shows that arbitration is not a, a still um, a it's not just still and stuck in what it was many years ago, but still a, it's a constantly changing and, and moving creature. So I think that takes us to the third topic that we had agreed to talk about, which is the uh, developments of international arbitration. I, I know what we spoke about previously in this webinar um, relates to many of the notable developments, but I think it's worth talking about um, the, the, the topic in, in a manner that shows um, what the developments are in, from the legislative and the judiciary point of view, and also about the recent institutional developments in the, the field of arbitration. So maybe I can ask Lucia to come back and to take us through what these recent developments are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sue. Um, I'm very happy to, to take this question first, uh, but I will, uh, I anticipate I will provide a very short answer and I really look forward to, to Javier's uh, comments and additions. So um, in a nutshell, 
uh, there are no recent legislative developments in our jurisdiction. And as I said before, I think this speaks well of the stability of the Spanish uh, legal regime for arbitration. In terms of institutional developments, it is my opinion that uh, we are here today witnessing uh, the most relevant one, which is the creation of the Madrid International Arbitration Center. Uh, Spain uh, has clearly met uh, for many years now the conditions uh, to become a first class international arbitration seat, uh, but we were also missing uh, one single strong arbitration institution that foreign practitioners could identify as the leading country for the purpose of cases seated in, in Spain. And uh, thanks to the merger of the international uh, practice of the Spanish uh, pre-existent, more uh, pre-existing, more uh, relevant uh, arbitral institution, which has uh, which has given birth to the to the MIAC, uh, we now clearly uh, have this item which was missing, and this is uh, having a real impact in the uh, development and international exposure of uh, Madrid as a uh, seat for international cases. And finally, in terms of uh, judiciary decisions, um, uh, we have uh, witnessed a very uh, relevant recent development regarding awards setting aside, um, on which I believe Javier is going to further elab elaborate, Sue, so I suggest that maybe we can pass the floor to him. Thank you. So Javier, if you could elaborate on the recent award or judgment. Well, thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Sue. Well, I'm going to refer to a recent ruling of the Spanish Constitutional Court of uh, February uh, this year concerning the interpretation, interpretation that must be made of the concept of public order as a ground for the setting aside uh, of uh, awards. Since uh, 2015, some Spanish courts, in particular the High Court of Justice of Madrid, have been uh, setting aside some arbitral awards on the ground that they breached the so-called public economic order. Public economic order would refer to certain basic rules and principles of contract law, such as bona fide, in cases needed of a particular protection. Based on this doctrine, the High Court of Madrid issued several judgments since uh, 2015, setting aside, uh, aside awards that did not consider null and void certain clauses contained in contracts entered with financial entities that were considered by the uh, Court of Madrid as contrary to the principle of bona fide. In the view of the High Court of Madrid, uh, those clause enshrined situations of imbalance, disproportion, or asymmetry between the contracted parties, either because of being one of them a consumer or because of the complexity of the financial product that was the object of the contract. The judgment of the Constitutional Court, to which I refer, rejects, uh, rejects uh, this doctrine, considering that the action of setting aside of an award has a very limited content and that it does not allow a review of the merits of the case. In other words, that it does, does not permit reviewing the facts and the law applied to the case. In particular, the Spanish Constitutional Court argues that public order can only be aimed at the analysis of possible breaches of the essential procedural rules applicable to the arbitration proceedings, such as, for example, the right of defense of the equal treatment of the parties. The Constitutional Court ruling represents, in my view, a very important support to Spain as a seat for arbitration, as it provides the legal certainty expected by economic operators. We cannot forget, however, the case law of the European Court of Justice, since its judgment, the Eco Suisse case. In Eco Suisse, uh, the European Court concluded that an application for the setting aside of an award must be granted if the award is in fact contrary to the antitrust rules enshrined in the current treaty of the functioning of the European Union. In other words, it follows from the case law of the European Court that the concept of public uh, economic order cannot be completely excluded as a ground for the uh, annulment of an uh, award, 
Although in the case of Spain, said economic public order must be limited to the European public order. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe I'll give a few minutes back to Hyunjung, since we heard about developments in Spain, to share us the recent developments in Korea the last three, four years um, that obviously have been a large change. So if you could share some of that with us. Sure, thank you. So uh, I briefly mentioned that you know the Korean Arbitration Act was uh, more recently um, amended again um, to reflect various various of the features of the 2006 Ancestral Model Law. Everything is moving towards more arbitration friendly in terms of broadening the scope of arbitrable disputes, the formal requirements of arbitration agreements being more relaxed and giving more power to arbitral tribunals for issuance of interim awards or for process uh, of um, aiding in the taking of evidence in um, in arbitration, also giving them more power to uh, express power to arbitral tribunals to award cost or interest and simplifying procedures of courts to for enforcement of um, of arbitral awards. In addition, in the same year in 2016, uh, the Korea passed an Arbitration Industry Promotion Act. So formally allows the Korean government to fund and support arbitral institutions, facilities, and practitioners in Korea. Of course, uh, KCAB has been a, a central part of uh, all this effort to uh, grow um, uh, grow awareness and and use and reliance. Uh, 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 on the on the arbitra um, on arbitral uh, legal infrastructure in Korea. More recently, um, in 2020, a bill has been proposed that applies more to litigation for a class action that can be brought in any area of law, which currently has been more for limited for securities, um, securities laws and securities uh, transactions. And uh, the opinion of the practitioners in arbitration has been that this undoubtedly would also influence and impact arbitration practice where um, uh, ideas will uh, emerge on the possibility of formalizing also class action in arbitration and not only in uh, litigation, which will be implemented formally in Korea. Um, in addition, of course, we are all very aware of the ongoing still COVID pandemic and um, Korea has not been foreign to that and many of the hearings and everything have been turned to virtual um, and it has been implemented uh, very well uh, and uh, a la par of all the other international arbitration institutions, um, I believe the KCAB has adopted also new rules that reflect emergency arbitration, expected expedited procedure in international arbitration. So we're progressing uh, hand in hand with all the um, trends and uh, standards of international arbitration. And um, Korea also uh, referring more to Latin America, perhaps linking it to Latin America and Spain and a little bit to trade. Um, at the beginning of this year in January, the Korea's Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy expressed that they would actively pursue expand the trade volume in, the, in, in Latin America. And they've been actively pursuing and they've conducted uh, within the government various uh, conversations to pursue that agenda. And they've been continuing actively uh, with the discussions to join Mercosur, to become an associate member of the Pacific Alliance and also to reform um, the cooperation, strategic economic co cooperation with Ecuador. And this is in addition to the various FTAs already in place with various Latin American countries like Chile, Peru, Colombia, Central America. And of course there is uh, BITs with uh, all of these different countries in the region and also with Spain since um, almost uh, 20, uh, like almost 30 years ago and the um, FTA with Europe. So with all of this, we will see more and more um, business going on across the borders. Thank you. And I think you made an excellent point about the government's will, or at least intent, to do whatever it can to help promote, increase the, the volume of trade between um, Latin America, Korea, Spanish-speaking countries, East Asia. Um, so this, I guess, leads to my very last topic, which perhaps I might call back Enrique to talk about. Um, so. Just freely, um, what 
Well, we were very interested, um, I think both KCAB and MIAC is very interested on expanding the interaction and relation between the legal communities of both countries. Um, what would be your suggestion as to what we should focus on in the near future so that there is more, more going between, going to and fro between the two countries? Would be interested to know. Uh, thank you, Sohyun. Well, as I advanced uh, uh, before, I think there are two points uh, uh, based on what uh, our colleague Hyun Jung was saying. Uh, Korea and Latin America, there is a long path uh, way ahead of us, but we need to, to find out which is the, the best collaboration for uh, getting those those missing two points I already mentioned uh, uh, to solve them. I mean, uh, there is no no arbitration chamber uh, specialized in, in investment relationships between Asia and Latin America. I think that this is a, a, a chance Korea has uh, given uh, the relationship uh, between uh, Spanish companies and Korean companies in those third countries. I think it's a good chance for, for Korea uh, jointly with, with Spain uh, to go in the same direction and to fulfill the needs in, in, in a region like, like Latin America, in which uh, since, since uh, years ago, the, the investments, obviously uh, on behalf of Spain, but uh, lately, uh, also, Korea, uh, you know, th throw the stone, uh, uh, kick off the course, and well, even though uh, Chinese uh, companies are already in Latin America, I think that there is, there is enough room for for Korea as well uh, to get uh, investments, uh, make investments there, and then of course uh, it's an opportunity for the two institutions uh, to, to to get on the top to to deal with the uh, potential disputes uh, between the companies of, of, the, of the two regions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any questions raised in the Q&A chat box. Um, I think the, the, the speakers have been so eloquent that the, the, the curiosity has been satiated by most uh, listeners. But uh, the, we invite anyone who's been listening or who's who hears this webinar later on and reporting to send um, either KCB or MIC any questions you may have about the contents of this uh, this webinar. Um, so I know I'm very conscious of the time. We have already reached the the scheduled time for this webinar. So for now, I'll turn back to the MC of our webinar to to say, I guess, to send everybody off. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, and I think that that concludes the webinar. The, the influence of civil law jurisdictions and their businesses cultures on international arbitration practice. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, the panelists and the moderator, especially for the, the insightful panel discussion. Uh, I thank you for the organizers, uh, MIAC and KCAB International, and a big thank you for all of you that followed us today. I hope you all have enjoyed these discussions as, as much as I did. Um, and well, for, if you need more information about the organizers of this webinar, uh, MIAC and KCAB International, uh, uh, I invite you to visit their websites, which are madridarb.com and kcabinternational.org.kr. So thank you all, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.